So, venerable members of the Sangha, venerable members of the Sangha, sisters, and lay friends, uh, I feel very um, honored to have been invited to offer a few words of reflection this afternoon on this incredibly auspicious occasion. Um, and having listened so far, it's been very uh, inspiring hearing uh, people's reflections, the thoughts um, about our teacher Ajahn Sumedho on his, in his 90th year. <clears throat> Trying to think if there's anything I can add to what's already been said. <laughs> it's more or less a case of what well, you heard what they said. I agree. <laughs> but perhaps um, to uh, repeat a few of the things that have come up uh, in my own words, uh, my own impressions, experiences over the See, 46, 47 years that I've known Ajahn Sumedho. Um, I first met him when he had just arrived in London in 1977. And I went to the Vihara and he was there. There was a puja and he was there. And he seemed quite young, very tall, very upright, and very warm and friendly. And uh, he welcomed me and and we went down and had a cup of tea. And he'd been talking very enthusiastically about monastic life and just sort of saying how wonderful it was. <laughs> and I remember the first question I asked him, it was a little bit challenging. I said, well, are you saying that everybody has to do this? <laughs> and I think he was a bit taken aback that I was quite so direct and almost fierce, I suppose. And uh, fortunately, he had somebody beside him. I think it was Venerable Ananda who was there. and and under the elder, and uh, he just smiled very sweetly and said, well, no, I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. We're not saying everybody has to do this, but it, it works for us. We find it helpful. And uh, somehow or other, that was my last possible objection. Because what I'd found that evening, um, although the monks looked very different from anything that I, anyone I'd met before, had contact with before, Although the chanting, the bowing, the ceremonies, the rituals were all very, uh, seemed very strange to me. And, um, and yet when he spoke um, after the meditation, what he said just made absolute sense. I've been practicing for quite a number of years within different traditions and uh, found them all absolutely wonderful. But there was something just incredibly refreshing about the simplicity and the directness of his explanation of the essential teachings of Buddhism. Later on, I did a retreat. And during that retreat, it was interesting what Ajahn Jayasara said about his reflection that if Ajahn Sumedha can do it, then I can do it. And I didn't have that, really. It was, it was a different thing, different experience for me, because Ajahn Sumedha was sitting up there, and every evening he would give a Dhamma talk and uh, basic teachings, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Paramitas. I remember he gave a talk, Anicca Dukkha Anatta. And I just listened, and I was just absolutely enthralled. I thought, this is absolutely wonderful, and marvelous, and fantastic. But I could never do that. He seemed like Superman. 
<laughs> this incredible sort of radiant, radiant being sitting there. But then he invited each of the monks who were sitting beside him uh, to offer a Dhamma reflection. And uh, when I heard them speaking, I thought, I had the thought, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> So it all began to seem much more accessible. <laughs> During that retreat, he also um, spoke about Chithurst. They had a map on the wall with a little pinpoint where Chithurst was. They hadn't actually moved there at that point, but they were preparing to move. And this was obviously something that was terrifically exciting. It was really exciting because, well, they, they'd grown up in Thailand come to London, living in London uh, through the winter times, particularly on a very, very busy street, uh, pavements, people, pollution, um, a lot of unpleasantness. Not, it wasn't like Thailand where everyone, you know, people are Buddhist, they know what a monk is, they know how to relate to a monk. They're eager to offer alms food. Um, I remember in, in the Vihara in Hampstead, you know, they had to send the Anagarikas to the market to, to buy food because there wasn't, they didn't have enough food and it was a very different situation. And so the thought of being able to move uh, to the countryside to have a proper forest monastery was, was very exciting. The fact that it was completely derelict was totally beside the point. <laughs> was the, the least of their concerns, as far as I could gather. But during that retreat, one evening, Arjun Samedi was talking about this wonderful place that they'd acquired and that they were going to have a monastery and, and a real proper place where monks, people could come and they could train as monks. And then almost as an afterthought, he said, and perhaps there'll be, um, if we might be even be able to have facilities where, where women can come and train as nuns. And uh, that was a very important moment for me. Um, and I kind of began to prepare myself to get to the first of the, queue, to the front of the queue, because I imagine that everybody would want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was quite a few months later before they actually moved uh, to Chithurst. Um, but during that, in, in the meantime, I'd, um, been to the Vihara several times, and I went once for a late night sit. It was a full moon or something, and um, some of you may have heard this story. But anyway, I was I was there with a group of lay people and Arjun Samedu and other bhikkhus and uh, samaneros and agarikas were there, and um, this woman arrived late. About 11 o'clock, I think, she came, and her name was Pat Stoll. And she'd just come back from Thailand, and she had a tape recording that had been made by an, an American nun called Mechi Kumfa, who was a disciple of Ajahn Chah, who had been living at Wat Pananachat and at Wat Pong. And she'd made this recording to give to a Burmese family whose daughter was interested in Buddhism, I think. So anyway, we listened to this talk, and uh, it was all about you know how it was to be a nun and things like that, and the life in Thailand. And Arjun Samedi looked at Rojan, looked at Pat, and looked at me, and he smiled. And he said, "That's our recruitment talk." <laughs> <laughs> Another interesting little aspect to that, though, is that um, during the evening, Arjun Samedi asked you know Pat if. Um, Achad Chah had suggested she might want to become a nun uh, in Thailand. And she said, no, um, no, because I'd already asked him if I could come to England and be ordained with you. And uh, Ajahn Sumedha looked a little bit surprised <laughs> because Ajahn Chah had never mentioned anything of that to him. <laughs> so Pat was going to be coming. And a little while later, I had permission to, to join the community as a as a as a nun, and Ajahn Sundra also dropped by for tea one day uh, at Chithurst, and uh, 
decided to be a nun and she's still here. <laughs> and uh, then Tanisra arrived. So there were four of us. Um, and Ajahn Samadhi, he was very skillful actually in how he um, welcomed us to the community because um, he'd had very little contact with nuns in Thailand. With, with the Mechis. They, they lived quite separately and their, their life and their training was very different from that of the monks. And so he, he didn't really know how to, how to train us or anything like that. But he did, he, one of the things that he realized was that the, uh, the Mechis, the nuns in white, they, they did the cooking. So <laughs> he said, well, just, just keep your, wash your white robes, and keep the eight precepts and the seventy-five sakya rules, and you know, don't don't worry about anything else. Just just you know, live, and we'll. He didn't even say we'll see how it works out. He just that was it. That was what he knew. That was what he was prepared to offer at that time. And we were totally delighted. We had no particular ambition to do anything else. It was just really wonderful for us to be able to be part of this group and to be welcomed uh, into the community at Chithurst uh, with the, with the um, I think it was about seven, six or seven monks and some Anagarikas and in this totally derelict house with Ajahn Sumedho right at the heart of, heart of things, um, offering teachings, offering encouragement, um, all through the, um, the whole building Process. I mean, there was no money, so they couldn't really do very much building, <laughs> but um, the whole community just took on uh, different projects to, to gradually uh, repair the house. So it was very harsh conditions, very cold in the winter time, and the food was very simple, but the spirit was very joyful. And this was largely because we all loved Ajahn Sumedho. We were all happy to be there with him and inspired by his example, his encouragement, his teaching. And um, we had no thought of doing anything else. We came here in 1984. Um, by then the community was a little bit larger. And by then, things were less straightforward because what had become what became more obvious was the disparity between the the monks and the nuns the, the, you know we were we were we had just been ordained on 10 precepts Ajahn Sumedha had decided after 3 years that it was it would be good if there were a possibility um, you know he saw that we were very sincere in our practice very enthusiastic about the practice very committed, and that we were ready to um, be able to um, take the ten precepts to, to, to become alms mendicants. And he did a really remarkable thing in that he went to Thailand and he spoke with various elders and uh, to see whether there could be a, an allowance for us to be ordained and to wear brown robes. Actually, we had a choice. We had a choice. We could have been pink or brown. <laughs> <laughs> and we all thought that brown was more suitable, like the, the, the color of the earth. And so um, we took on the, the brown robes. And uh, I'd never really asked for it, but at the same time, the thought of it was just so gladdening to be able to to live in that way as an arms mendicant. I'd had lots of money before, and I was, as an Anigari car, we can spend money, and I could also drive, so every time I went to town, I would buy things. And it wasn't very peaceful for the mind. So to be able to just stop doing that and to be a bit more settled in one place to focus on the uh, inner practice, um, a different kind of service. I'd got very used to service, to you know, doing, doing stuff. <laughs> um, but the more, more, more focus on the inner practice was, I really appreciated. And it was, as I said, quite a daring thing. What well, daring? That's, 
not quite the right word, but quite bold to have taken that step at a time when um, really there was nothing like that um, available in Thailand. In fact, the first person who went to ask, I won't say who it was, but somebody had been before to check it out and came back with the answer, well, it's, it's not allowed, it's not legal. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. But Arjun Sumedha was very careful how he presented it and who he asked and how he asked. And so he was able to get the permission for us to, to become alms mendicants. So we had, we were given alms bowls. That was part of our cere ordination ceremony. And um, it was a big, big step for our community. Even so, there was a concern because, um, as you all know, there's a, in Thailand, and, and in fact in the Buddha's teachings, there is a discrepancy. The, the monks come first and the nuns come second. And in our culture, this was something that uh, was not very easily um, accommodated. So we were in a funny position, uh, whereas in Thailand, for a nun to even have the slightest idea of being kind of equivalent to a monk was considered totally inappropriate. You know, who does she think she is? How dare she even imagine that she could be anything equivalent to a monk? That was the situation in Thailand, whereas in the West, the idea of that the women weren't, that the nuns weren't, was absolutely shocking and totally unacceptable. So it was, it was like two, two ideologies kind of colliding. And in a way, this, is, this has been something that we've been um, uh, sort of negotiating, uh, working with over the years. Um, and I think for Arjun Samedo, it's been um, also very, very challenging. Um, one of the things that he uh, admitted very early on was that he, you know, he 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 could he could train monks. He understood about uh, what what monks' needs were and how how to guide them uh, in the vineyard in their practice and so on. Uh, but I think with with the nuns, we were we were a bit of a mystery. In fact, I think we still may be a bit of a mystery. <laughs> um, we didn't always respond in quite the way that he 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 would expect. And uh, uh, so a, a mystery and also a frustration. I was interested in Ajahn Jayasara's comment about. Um, how um, the, the need to have patience with your with your pupils, with your students, and I think, um, well, some of us. I, I I know that I've tested his patience sorely on on many occasions. Um, I've always been very sincere and very very committed and very inspired by his teaching, and always tried to put it into practice. But I think sometimes. It was just um, uh, there'd be times when we just didn't didn't quite understand each other. This does in no may, way uh, one one of the things I was thinking when I was thinking about what I might say. Um, I was reflecting on two two. Um, two um, teachings of the Buddha. One was, um, which has already been alluded to a little bit, was towards the time of the Buddha's demise. And uh, I actually just read this story. We had a Westsack festival up at Milne Hume Hermitage where I live. And uh, the story of the Buddha's uh, Parinibbana and how he lay down in the sala tree grove between the sala trees and the flowers all, the trees all appeared in blossom, which the blossom started dropping onto the Buddha's body and there was heavenly music playing and uh, all kinds of miraculous things were happening. And and saying, that, but this is, and then he said, but this is not how Tathagata is honored, respected, revered. Rather it is the, the monk, the nun, the layman, the laywoman, 
who practices according to the teachings, who walks in the way, who walks in the Eightfold Path. That's the best way of honoring, respecting, revering the teacher. And yesterday out watching the the nuns putting up the other nuns putting up the balloons and the 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 the, the, the golden balloon, happy 90th birthday, and all of the preparations and the gifts. I've been so touched by the way that the community has worked together to, to bring this occasion about. Um, very, very impressive. During the last weeks, I've was been up at Miltium, very, very, very quiet, and just thinking, I'm glad I'm not at Amaravati. <laughs> <laughs> just imagining how, how one could plan such an event, how you could organize it, and all of the different things that needed to be thought about. So a big, a big thank you to the community here for, um, and to, particularly to Ajahn Amaro for just being willing to even think about uh, preparing for such an occasion. Uh, it's, it's very, very beautiful. And realizing that, yes, this is, this is definitely a way of honoring, respecting, revering Lumpur Sumedho. And the best way uh, is through our practice, through our efforts to, um, one of the things he, he, his phrase is, is not making a problem about things. No. So contemplating dukkha, suffering, the arising of suffering, the ending of suffering, the past leading to the ending of suffering, and then the short, 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 a shorthand, don't make a problem about it. <laughs> So whatever's happening, don't make a problem about it. <clears throat> the other um, teaching that came to my mind was a teaching about um, one's parents and how um, all of us have parents and the debt of gratitude to our parents and how even if we carried them around on our shoulders for the rest of their lives, um, that would still not repay the debt of gratitude. Even if they weren't very good parents, even if they made lots of mistakes, uh, we would still, that's still the case because they've given us this opportunity to have a human body and to be able to, to practice these teachings. And in the same way with Lumpur, especially for myself as a nun, you know, even though there are times that he clearly, uh, there was a misunderstanding, there was a kind of not, not quite, uh, 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 you know, one, one could uh, criticize uh, different ways that he's responded to situations. Um, nevertheless, a, a confidence that he, he did the very best he could. And that's the thing that I'm grateful for, his, his integrity, his sincerity, and his absolute commitment to his own uh, awakening and to getting all of us to awaken as well. You know, that's, 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 that's his sole interest for us to awaken and to stop suffering. So what... What more could one ask for? So, um, sometimes I think, well, what can I do? What can I give? You know, I would, I would like to be able to give something, but I realize, well, just my sincerity, my uh, integrity, my good efforts uh, to understand the suffering that I create for myself and to uh, bring about its cessation. This is what I can do. And just one little further thing, one of the things that I determined very early on, seeing Lumpur's generosity uh, in sharing teachings. I mean, he was, he would give lots and lots of teachings in the community. We, we were thinking about this uh, yesterday we had a, a gathering with the former sisters and uh, just re recollecting how breakfast time would be this amazing event every day and he would share his understanding of the teachings. All, it, we always found it very, absolutely, we were transfixed. We would have gone on all morning if, if, we, if we could have done, um, just listening to him. 
and also his readiness to respond when people were really struggling with something. Um, a, a, very, a very remarkable sensitivity and kindness that would come through. Several of the former sisters mentioned this, and a little story when I was in Thailand, I decided um, after quite a number of years of practice that I really needed to go to Thailand to get my practice, to get my meditation together. I didn't feel I could meditate very well, so I went to this monastery uh, to learn how to meditate. This was after about 20 years, I have to say, as a nun. <laughs> and I was having quite a difficult time because the, the main focus was on concentration practice. And some of you may have heard Lumpur talking. It, he, he teaches much more a reflective way of practice. And uh, anyway, halfway through this time, this handwritten letter arrived from Arjun Samedo. And the monks, they, they, they saw this letter, they, they looked at this letter, oh, she, he's written to Ajahn, Ajahn, Ajahn Chandasiri, he's got a letter from Ajahn Samedo, from her teacher. And they, they, they were rather impressed. <laughs> anyway, I, I opened this letter and I can't remember, there's little bits of news about the monastery. And then the final sentence was, and I hope you're not struggling too much on account of jhana. <laughs> it was such a kind, uh, sensitive uh, response to my situation. Uh, stuck out in the woods, forest in Thailand, not being able to get jhana at all. And just this really real kind uh, response to that. So, um, because of his generosity, I, I, people are talking about making vows. I guess I made a kind of vow that when I was invited to teach, I would never refuse. So when Ajahn Amaro asked if I would share some reflections, I was all, totally happy to do that um, out of gratitude and respect for our teacher, Lumpur Sumedho. So these are just a few thoughts for your contemplation.